Hey class, welcome back to World History 2. I hope you're all doing well today. In today's teaching session, we'll be looking at Monarchs Part 1, which is going to be a look at the House of Tudor. Stay tuned for the PowerPoint. Okay class, we're going to now have a PowerPoint a lecture on uh, the Monarchs, kind of like the rise of the Monarchs. We're going to be going through um, on the House of Tudor, T-U-D-O-R, Tudor uh, today. And looking at the kings and queens of the House of Tudor. All right, so on the screen you can see that uh, there's uh, six monarchs uh, for the House of Tudor. Uh, these would uh, be the kings and queens of England. And um, you see there that uh, Lady Jane Grey is uh, there in the kind of in the middle. Uh, there's a dispute about her because she only reigned for nine days, and some people say that she didn't uh, was not even in line for the monarchy uh, because Mary the first was but uh, we'll get to that in a second so that's the list in order of the kings and queens we have Henry the seventh his name is also Henry Tudor he's the founder of the house of Tudor Henry the eighth very well known his son Edward the sixth then Lady Jane Grey then Mary the first which is Bloody Mary and then Elizabeth the first. And we're going to go through each one of these today in this lecture. First off is Henry the seventh or Henry Tudor. Uh, each one you'll see their life and their reign. The dates for their life, the dates for their reign. You don't need to know the dates for an exam or anything, but just to give you an idea of the time period as we move through it. Uh, his life is fifteen, excuse me, 1457 to 1509, and he reigned from 1485 to 1509 and how he came to power was uh, he won the war of the roses uh, by defeating richard the third who was of the house of york and when he defeated him uh, at the battle of bosworth uh, henry the seventh henry tudor he became the king and he was the first tudor monarch he had a wife named Elizabeth uh, of York, and he had eight children, and there's a possibility of one illegitimate child, so there's a possibility of nine of them. But the rightful heir was Henry VIII. And so you can see a picture there of Henry VII. And I, we're not going to talk too much of detail about Henry VII, but Henry VIII, his son, uh, comes to power. He lived 1491 to 1547. And he reigned from 1509 to 1547, so pretty pretty decent length, almost 40 years of reigning as uh, as the king, uh, the first king of England there to be called Your Majesty. Henry VIII is known for quite a bit, and one of the most famous things he's known for is he was married uh, six times, and that was kind of unheard of for the time. I mean, definitely. Uh, kings, if their wife died, or they would have another wife. Some of them just had uh, mistresses and all that too. But um, he was married six times, and they all had kind of different ways of ending. Uh, you can see the little poem there, a little jingle. Uh, King Henry the Eighth to six wives he was wedded. One died, one survived, two divorced, and two beheaded. So a little kind of way of remembering it: six wives. One died, one survived, two divorced, two beheaded. The reason was was that he he desperately wanted a son. I mean, he was this was very consuming to him. He wanted a son to pass on the the, the heir, and that's very important, especially in those days with a king. Um, and they would blame the the queen if she did not produce a son. So here are. Um, his wives. Now there's five on this screen and one on the next. I couldn't fit them all on the screen really the way I formatted it. Uh, but this will give us a good idea. So we have Catherine of Aragon who he divorced. And this divorce, which we're going to see just in a moment, is what sparked the uh, English Reformation with Henry VIII um, defying the Pope because the Pope would not grant Henry the eighth, a divorce from Catherine of Aragon. So um, in the end, he divorces her anyway, starts the English Reformation, and which ended up starting the Church of England. And his second wife was uh, Anne Boleyn. 
And that marriage ended with her being beheaded uh, with a charge of treason. And he then had his third wife, which is Jane Seymour. Uh, Jean Seymour died in childbirth when she was giving birth to Edward VI. So Henry VIII finally has a son, Edward VI, so he has an heir. But Jane Seymour dies. And so he goes and gets married to Anne of Cleves. And Anne of Cleves and Henry didn't uh, get along very well. The marriage was not very long. And he divorces her and marries Catherine Howard. Uh, Catherine Howard is beheaded uh, for adultery, and Henry VIII then finally marries Catherine Parr, who she was married to him until his death, so she survived. Okay, so that's the wives. I'll go back. That's the wives of Henry VIII, and you can see these paintings uh, here of them. Uh, this is early Renaissance. Okay, some details about Henry VIII. Uh, he strengthened England when he started the Church of England, which is also called the Anglican Church. And what he did was, uh, when they broke from Rome, when they broke from the Catholic Church, um, there were a lot of Catholic church buildings and monasteries and lands and wealth in England. And so when they broke from it, Henry VIII basically just confiscated all of it and said it's now part of the Church of England, which he was recognized as the head of the Church of England. So they, he, he, he got a lot of wealth from taking these buildings, lands, etc. Now, uh, most of the church buildings remained, but they did get rid of a lot of the monasteries. The monasteries, a lot of them were actually torn down or destroyed. Some were put to other purposes. Um, but it all belonged now to Henry VIII. Uh, he spoke out against Martin Luther and Pope Leo X, called him the defender of the faith. Now, obviously, that's before there was a break with Rome. Um, when the Reformation started, uh, Henry VIII wasn't involved in it, really. He was still Catholic and, and a faithful Catholic. And so he spoke out against Martin Luther. Well, that made the Pope happy, and so the Pope called him the defender of the faith. 1527, he wants a divorce from Catherine of Aragon. He tries to have it annulled, but the Pope says no. So we're going to run through that story really quick. In April 1532, Thomas Cromwell won control of the government council and thereafter remained in command for some eight years. Made the decision that the English church should be separated from Rome, becoming effectually, effectively a spiritual department of the state under the rule of the king as God's deputy on earth. Now, that's, that's the important part I want you to know. I know there's a big paragraph on the screen, but this part here is what I want you to know. Effectively, a spiritual department of state under the rule of the king as God's deputy on earth. So basically, it's the king is now in the office of what the pope was. The pope would be the deputy on earth for Jesus in the Catholic Church, down in Rome, in the Vatican. Well, in England, in London, Henry VIII is basically taking that role. He is now going to be God's deputy on earth for the Church of England. The revolution that he had not intended gave the king his wish. In 1533, he married Anne Boleyn. In May, a new archbishop, Thomas Cranmer, presided over the formality of a trial that declared the first marriage annulled. And then in September, the Princess Elizabeth I was born. The Pope retaliated with a sentence of excommunication, and it troubled no one. So basically, when they broke from the church... Uh, Thomas Cranmer, who um, was the Archbishop now in the Church of England, not of not of the Catholic Church, but in the Church of England, he basically just made an announcement that the king's divorce went through and the marriage to Anne Boleyn was was okay. 1534 is the Act of Supremacy. Henry VIII formally separated from the Church of England from all obedience to Rome. However, the Church of England basically remained Catholic in practice, just the king as the head the only supreme head on earth of the Church of England. So Henry VIII never set out to create a new religion or to uh, 
you know, just get rid of the Church of England, or excuse me, the Church of, of Rome in, in Catholicism, it basically uh, remained the same, and the practices remained the same. It wasn't until the English Reformation when Protestantism started to uh, come in from, from Europe and Protestant beliefs were then preached and people were following Protestantism, and basically the Church of England was becoming more Protestant. That's when Henry VIII began following Protestant beliefs also. So the Catholic Church really lost ground uh, under uh, Henry VIII and the Act of Supremacy because it just declared that Henry VIII was now in place of the Pope. What this did, it led to nationalism. A lot of the people of England really started to identify as Protestants. Uh, a lot of Catholics left England. They left and went back to Europe, uh, to the mainland of Europe. And so England really began to become an, have their identity with Protestantism under the Henry VIII. And then that would actually continue on for um, his son, Edward VI, and then we're going to skip a monarch, and then it will come back in, under Elizabeth I, which we'll see that in a second, because that monarch we skipped is Mary I, who was a staunch Catholic. But over time, the last point on the slide, over time the Church of England began to be corrupt, and the Puritans tried to purify it. Now that purification uh, would come later on. This is not purification under Henry VIII, really. What I just put, wanted to put there was that the Church of England was uh, solidified down into a national religion, and they became kind of corrupt, just like the Catholic Church was. And they ended up needing to be purified by the Puritans. And again, that's later on, but this is setting the stage for the Puritan movement. Henry VIII um, also became wealthy, uh, not just from taking the lands from the Catholic Church, but he also raised fines and fees on m many things. Um, it, it, you know, fines and fees are an easy way to get money. That goes all the way till today. Find and taxed and pay fees and for everything that you can think of now, uh, today. Uh, but back then it was the same way, easy way to make money. They, he, he put a tax on beards. Um, if you want to have a beard, I guess you had to pay a tax. Uh, there was the pickage tax, which forced theater groups to pay a tax to set up a booth at a fair. Um, these groups were very popular entertainment of the day. So in our, in our modern minds of the 21st century, we have entertainment at our fingertips. We can watch movies on our iPhones or, or tablets. You can you know, watch any one of the hundreds of TV channels. Well, you know, there was um, entertainment back then, but it was very limited. But what entertainment there was was very popular. And so when you think of a theater group, they would set these fairs up all the time. I mean, basically all throughout the spring, summer, and the fall months, they would have uh, these fairs going on, and these different groups would come in, and there'd be a party atmosphere, uh, a lot of food, and, and just entertainment. And they would have uh, these booths set up, which would be kind of like a stage with seating and everything, and a, a theater group would pl do a play. And so Henry VIII uh, would basically put a tax on them so that they, could, they would tax the people if they wanted to set up a booth uh, at the fair. Now, this is, uh, this is before Shakespeare. Uh, the Shakespearean plays are going to come under Elizabeth I. But it's, it's, you know, there were plays going on then too. So it was a way for him to make money. And also uh, what he did was our last bullet point there was provide a public relief to the poor. And this is important because there were there were a lot of poor people uh, in uh, the Renaissance times, and you know just because serfdom and fiefdom had ended uh, didn't mean everyone had their own jobs and were all out there making all kinds of money. Uh, there were a lot of poor people. There was a, still a great class divide where you had the uh, upper class nobility, and then you had the middle class, which may have had a trade. You know, most likely had a trade. And then you had the lower class, which was numerous people, which either didn't have anything or they were working fields. Well, under Henry VIII, um, there was public relief to the poor with food and, and uh, things given, uh, shelter, um, you know, poor houses, all of that given. So um, people became dependent on Henry VIII, and that, that can make a monarch uh, very popular. Um, with If you have a lot of people who are... Um, 
enjoying the free things from the monarch, that monarch is very popular with those people that are getting the free things. Now, not so much popular with the people that are getting fined and taxed to pay for it, uh, but Henry VIII was a pretty popular uh, king in regards to the relief to the poor. All right, so Henry VIII, he actually he ends up dying, and uh, his son, Edward VI, uh, takes over. And his life is 1537 to 1553, so you see he does not live very long. And his reign uh, is 1547 to 1553. His reign was very short. Uh, he was called the Boy King because he ascended to the throne at nine years old. Okay, it's Henry VIII's only son, and so he ascends to the throne at nine years old. Now, Henry VIII had been trying so hard to have a son. He finally has a son, and he, the son, when he comes to the throne at nine years old, he ends up dying at the age of 16. So he doesn't uh, reign very long. His mother was Jane Seymour, Henry, the third, uh, Henry VIII's third wife. He was as a nine-year-old. He was advised by Protestant advisors. So the Protestant Reformation had been up and going now for um, about thirty years in Europe, and that that had gone over into uh, England by now. And the English Reformation was up and going, and and there were Protestant advisors that advised Edward the Sixth. Well, what happened was this youth, I think at nine years old, dies at sixteen. He becomes a staunch Protestant, and there's a lot of records and uh, court writings, uh, even sermons. Uh, for example, uh, Sir Hugh Latimer uh, was a English reformer, and he preached in front of Edward VI on a good number of occasions. Uh, but Edward VI was a staunch Protestant. Okay, he was completely anti-Catholic. In 1549, Thomas Cranmer who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, enacted many reforms in the name of Edward the uh, VI. That should be Edward the VI. I'm sorry, it's a typo right here. See on the screen, I'm circling it. There sh that, w that should not be there. It's Edward the VI. Okay, so the reforms that were um, enacted was basically Mass was replaced with Communion. So no more Catholic Mass. Instead, we're going to have Communion. It abolished Confession. It denied the idea of Purgatory. They said that priests could marry Catholic images, wall paintings, and stained glass were destroyed. So even the images that would be created out of the stained glass in the Catholic church and monasteries, they would have a lot of stained glass images, like kind of telling stories on the glass. Um, this was all destroyed. And then there was the erection of pulpits uh, for preaching. And even though there may have been uh, some kind of a, a place where the priest would stand to speak, uh, when you look at uh, the Catholic churches of back, that, back then and even till today, uh, pulpits are off to the side uh, for the most part, and the very center of the stage or the church is going to be uh, where the elements of the bread and the wine are, where the Eucharist is prepared and taken. So, and usually there's a crucifix hanging somewhere there, either from the ceiling or on the wall, center stage. Uh, but here, uh, we see under Edward VI the erection of pulpits um, in front of the church, where the word of God would be preached. But Edward VI, as I said, he doesn't live very long, and uh, he gets sick with tuberculosis. He dies. When he was dying, um, he was really trying to be adamant that his half-sister, Mary, um, he tried to keep her from becoming queen. He did not want her to become queen, and the reason was she was a staunch Catholic. So after Edward VI dies, Lady Jane Grey, she comes uh, on scene here, 1537 to 1554 is her life. Now notice her reign, July 10th, 1553 to July 19th, 1553. She was queen for nine days. Uh, she was a distant relation to Henry VIII, but basically, she was queen for nine days. Mary I um, rose up against her. She had her arrested, thrown in the Tower of London, and then uh, executed her. So we see uh, Lady Jane Grey was not queen very long. Some people dispute that she was even a rightful queen because of the, the lineage. I mean, Mary I was one of the children of Henry VIII. 
Um, but Lady Jane Grey, she went to the throne for nine days. And here's a picture of the execution of Lady Jane Grey by Paul de la Roche, um, 1833. That was painted, but you can see there's some people over here, probably ladies in waiting. Uh, these are the maids that would um, service the queen, uh, wait on the queen. Here's a priest. And this here is the, obviously the executioner. He has the axe in his hand. She's going to be put down on her head, put down here on the chopping block. Uh, they would basically uh, make the person uh, hold onto this ring with their hands or kind of wrap their arms around the block and hold that ring as their head is up here. And then he would chop off the head. The straw there is to keep the blood from making a big mess. It would kind of soak up into the straw. So that's... Um, the gory details of the execution of Lady Jane Grey. Okay, so then after uh, Lady Jane Grey comes Mary the First, A.K.A. Uh, Bloody Mary, and there's a picture of her. It looks like a happy woman. Um, her life was 1516 to 1558. Her reign was very short, but it was also very bloody. 1553 to 1558 was her reign. Now, she was a staunch Catholic, so completely opposite of Henry VIII and uh, Edward VI and Lady Jane Grey. So, uh, during her reign, she reversed the English Reformation and moved England back to a Catholic country. Um, in 1555, she banned English Bibles in England. She banned all English Bibles in England, so they became a book that was... Um, when confiscated, usually burned. Uh, many of the books were hidden. Um, a lot, obviously, a lot of them uh, went with people fleeing England. A lot of the Protestants fled England to the mainland Europe, and they took their Bibles with them. Uh, but she did ban the English Bibles. England, it just went into a big state of turmoil because now you've had the Church of England established for a good number of years under Henry VIII and Edward VI, and now you have Mary reverse, reversing it back to Catholicism, which the Pope was all happy about this. And she's known as Bloody Mary because of the numerous Protestants that she had killed for their faith. And it wasn't that she went out and hunted them down and killed them. It was basically they were arrested, they were given the opportunity to recant and accept the Catholic faith, and then if they still refused um, the Catholic faith, then they were executed. 300 people burned at the stake. Uh, most of them were pretty high-profile people, like uh, one that I had mentioned earlier was uh, Hugh Latimer. Uh, that was a, um, he was a, a pretty big guy in the English Reformation. Uh, I mean, he was like almost like the pastor to the court, to all the people in the court with the, the kings. And um, he, he preached to Henry, uh, Henry VIII, he preached to Edward VI, and other um, high-profile people he would preach to. And he would preach uh, the truth of the Reformation. He was burned at the stake. Uh, many Protestants went into exile in Europe. Um, but here's the thing. Her antics fire, backfired and more were drawn to Protestantism, which usually that's the case. Whenever there's a persecu persecution of the church, uh, persecution of Christians, many people actually join the ranks of the Christian through converting to Christianity because uh, they see that uh, the people that are being martyred are being martyred for a, a reason and it just attracts people to see the real life of people uh, the real life of the protestants in this case so it actually backfired on her and the protestantism continued to grow uh, she marries uh, spanish king philip uh, but in the end she ends up dying of cancer and her sister mary actually uh, elizabeth Mary's sister, Elizabeth, who's Elizabeth I, she becomes queen. And we're going to go to her. Okay, Elizabeth I. There she is there on the right-hand side. Um, very well-known queen. Some people say she was one of the greatest monarchs in history, as you see it on the screen there in the middle of the screen. Um, you know, there's others that were great monarchs also. I think Queen Victoria of the 19th century was a really popular and excellent monarch. But Elizabeth I, her life was 1533 to 1603. 
her reign was a long reign, 1558 to 1603. So quite a long reign. Um, she was a uh, Protestant. Uh, now the thing is, is that she tried to um, bring some peace to kind of like both sides of the of the equation uh, for Protestant and Catholicism, and it ended up it ended up being a Protestant nation under the Church of England, and Elizabeth the first was the um, the head of the Church of England. But her reign really was a reign of religious turmoil. There was a lot of problems, a lot of fighting going on. But it was a Protestant nation again. She was the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. She became queen at 25. And even though she's a tutor, and she's the last tutor, by the way, the last one in the line, um, it's called the Elizabethan Age. Um, is what is you know the time period that she uh, reigned through the Elizabethan age and many many people um, especially ones that were popular monarchs or reigned a long time uh, that's what kind of like the age gets named after them such as the Victorian period after Queen Victoria the Edwardian period after King Edward so Elizabeth, Elizabeth was the Elizabethan age, and this is the age of Shakespeare, so this is when he lived and, and wrote his plays. Uh, the Spanish Armada, there it is, a picture of it. Um, and that was one of the main events that take place under Elizabeth I's uh, reign because of the consequences of the Spanish losing uh, their, their, their fleet. So Elizabeth I, her characteristics, she was, a, she was a shrewd monarch. She was skilled in diplomacy, so she could deal with other kings and queens and deal with politicians and all of that. Uh, she was not really religious um, all that much. I had mentioned kind of that a little bit. She kind of like tried to play both sides. But she did use Protestantism uh, for her politics. And then in 1588, uh, her forces defeat the Spanish Armada, and I'm going to give you some details of that. So you see a picture there, a pretty violent picture of the British uh, fleet destroying the Spanish Armada on the high seas. Okay, so here's the story of the defeat of the Spanish Armada. We'll just go down through it briefly. Uh, the Spanish Armada, the great and most fortunate navy, uh, was a Spanish fleet of 130 ships that sailed from La Coruña, in August of 1588, the purpose of escorting an army from Flanders, the purpose it sailed was to escort an army from Flanders, which is in France, to invade England. The reason for this was that Elizabeth I executed the Catholic Mary Queen of Scots in 1587, and so Spain decided to invade England because of this. Elizabeth I is the Queen of England. But the Scots, the, the Scotland, they had their own line of kings and queens also. It would not, uh, the lines would not come together until the next monarch that we're going to look at, um, which is the first monarch in the line of the Stuarts. But um, right now, as it is, there's a separate line of monarchies. In Scotland. Well, one of them, her name was Mary. This is not Mary the First in regards to Bloody Mary. It's not Bloody Mary. This is Mary, Queen of Scots. Well, Elizabeth I has her killed, and Spain decides this is our time now to invade England. The defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588 has long been held as one of England's greatest military achievements. That's pretty important. The Armada's failure made Spain less powerful in Europe, and it also changed the way sea battles were fought. Now, one of the important things to remember is you have explorers going all around the world now, and many of these explorers were being funded by um, England, Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands. You know, there's different uh, groups that are now out there exploring. Well, England basically destroys the naval power of Spain, who was a, a huge player in the exploration game. So this was very, uh, very important for England. 
and it kind of knocked the Spanish down a, a good number of notches. The defeat of the Armada saved England from invasion, and it dealt a heavy blow to the prestige of Europe, one of great, uh, Europe's greatest powers of the age, which was Spain. Uh, tactically, the Armada action has enduring historical significance as the first major naval gun battle under sail. So you start thinking now about having cannons on ships and coming up with the different tactics to fight each other with uh, cannon um, laden ships firing on one another. Usually it involved um, either ramming them and shooting or coming up alongside of each other and just blasting at each other till the ships, one of the ships sank. But when you have 130 ships and majority of them sink, that's, that's pretty significant. So it ended Spain's uh, domination of the Atlantic. And then look at the very last bullet point. England would rule the seas for over 300 years. It would last a long time where England is exploring and they are the naval, naval power. Uh, there's, they're the army power in some instances. Um, in Europe, there's, they fight battles with their land army against Napoleon. Uh, they, fight, they fight, obviously, land battles in uh, the New World and the colonies during the Revolutionary War. They fight all kinds of battles under Queen Victoria in the 19th century. So England is going around the world and just conquering all kinds of area territory uh, to where there's a phrase that the sun never sets on Great Britain, which means the sun is always up somewhere in the world on a territory owned by Great Britain. Okay, so that's the Spanish Armada. Continuing with Elizabeth I, uh, she never married, even though she reigned a long time and, and actually lived a long time for for that time period. She lived till she was almost 70. Uh, never married she had no children, and she is called the Virgin Queen. Um, she fell ill and died in a deep state of depression, which they say in one of the writings, it's uh, an unremovable melancholy had come across her, which is like deep sadness or depression. Uh, she was the last of the Tudors, Elizabeth I, last of the Tudors. And then her throne passes to James VI of Scotland, which enters the time of the Stuarts. And we're going to see in our next PowerPoint, starting with him, that this is where the line of monarchs in Scotland and the line of monarchs in England come together. And then that, that starts the House of Stuarts. Okay, that's it for Monarchs Part 1. See you in a second. Okay, class, that's it for today's teaching session. Next time we'll be looking at Monarchs Part 2, where we will look at the House of Stuart. And we will also be looking at a few other kings and queens in uh, some other areas of the world. I'll see you then.